In 2.3, we're going to look at analyzing graphs of functions. So we've learned the definition of function. Now we're going to kind of look at um, analyzing the different graphs. So we have studied the functions from algebraic point of view. So in this section, we're going to study functions from a graphical perspective. So remember a couple things. The graph of a function is the collection of ordered pairs, x, comma, f of x. Remember, that's just our new notation. So you could even call it x, comma, y, because these are the same such that x is in the domain of f. So we're going to use the graph function of f shown in figure 2.26, so this nice graph off to the right, to find three different things. We're going to be looking for the domain of f, the functional values of f of negative 1 and f of 2, and the range of f. So some things that I want you to know. When we're looking at domain, we're looking at all the possible x values. So we're looking at from the farthest left, which happens to be this side, to the farthest right, which is this side. So we're starting at negative 1, and we're going to positive 5. Now notice, this is a colored in circle right here, so that means we're going to include negative 5, kind of like when we were working with our number lines. But this is an open circle here, so that means it's just a boundary point, so we're going to use a parentheses right there. We can also write that as negative 1 is less than or equal to x is less than 5. So there's two different ways you can write the domain of f for this function. Again, your domain is how far you're going from left and right, all your possible x values. I don't want to work this out and look at a table and look at every point in between. That would be tedious, and we want to look at it in an overall perspective. Another thing we can look at is range, so I'm going to drop down here to range real quick. Range is all your possible y values. So now I'm looking at this y-axis, I'm looking how far does it go up? Well, it goes up to um, 3, and it goes all the way down to negative 3, and in this case I do have a point up here at 3, and I do have a point at negative 3, and you can see I've got points everywhere in between that, so I'm going to do this one with brackets. You can also write this one as an inequality, you just have to put a y in there. Oop, I wrote that all backwards, sorry about that. I need my smaller one on the left and my larger one on the right. So when you're looking at domain, you're looking at how far left to right. When you're looking at range, you're looking at how far top to bottom. And now then, function values. So that means they want you to be able to find the corresponding y value. Because remember, this is just an x value, f of negative 1. So that means go to negative 1 on your graph. And that would be actually right here. And what is that y value? It's actually positive 1. So I would just say equals 1. Or I could write as an ordered pair as you see here. f of 2. So here's positive 2 down here. Here's my ordered pair, as you can see I've kind of found. And so I could just write that as equal to negative 3. So when we're looking at function values, they just want you to be able to locate an x value and see what the corresponding y value is for that function. So you can see the solutions here. Let me move it up a little bit for you. Um, that the closed dot at negative 1, 1 indicates that x is equal to negative 1. So this is that domain question. They were talking about the domain. It's in the domain of f, whereas the open dot at 5, 2 indicates it's not in the domain. So it can be written as the interval, or remember we talked about how it could be written in, as an inequality as well. So either of those would be good answers for your domain. Um, in part C, that was your range. I'll just jump down there. It says because the graph does not extend um, below f of 2 at negative 3 or above f of 0 at 3, then the range is in that interval. And remember, we can also write that as an inequality, but this time you have to plug in y because that's when you're talking about your range. And then the middle it says because negative 1, 1 is a point on the graph, notice this. It can be written as f of negative 1 is equal to 1. So these are equivalent. It's two different ways of writing it. This is your ordered pair, and this is using your function notation. And likewise, because 2 common negative 3 is a point on the graph, it follows that f of 2 is equal to negative 3. So when you're faced with questions like this and they say fine, like f of 2 or f of negative 1, you're just going to locate that point on the graph and then type in whatever the y value is. Again, these are two equivalents, an ordered pair versus function notation. The use of dots, open or closed, at the extreme left and right points of a graph, like we saw in that previous problem, indicates that the graph does not extend beyond these points. If no such dots are shown, we assume that the graph extends beyond these points. 
by the definition of a function, at most one y value corresponds to an x value. So remember, our x can't repeat. That means that the graph of a function cannot have two or more different points with the same x coordinate. And no two points on the graph can be vertically above or below. Again, that's where the x's don't repeat. If they were to repeat, that would get put them vertically on top of each other. So it follows then that a vertical line can intersect the graph of a function at most once. We've already talked about this in a previous lecture, and this is called your vertical line test. So your book notes it here in a, in a nice blue box. It says a set of points in a coordinate plane is the graph of y as a function of f if and only if no vertical line intersects at the graph at more than one point. So we've already looked at this once, but let's reevaluate this again now that we're analyzing graphs. And so all this being said, what we're going to be looking at some zeros of functions. If a graph of a function x has an intercept at 8, 0, then it's called a zero of the function. The zeros of a function, notice our blue box here, are the x values for which f of x equals 0. So all this being said, we've been doing this. Um, a zero of the function, they'll also begin to call a root, or also that is an x-intercept. Okay. And what have we been doing in chapter 1? We've been taking equations and setting them equal to 0. So look, an equation set equal to 0. So it's not something new, it's just naming what we've been doing. So you'll notice in this one I have a lot of stuff worked out, but let me tell you what I've done here because again, this is stuff that you've seen before and this is what we've been doing in chapter one. It says find all the zeros of the function. So notice here, A, that's a quadratic. We know how to find that. You take your quadratic here, you factor it, well you said equal to zero, which is standard form. You factor it, you get your two parentheses, and then you draw your table and you say, okay, let me set 3x minus 5 equals 0, and x plus 2 equals 0, and you get your answers of 5 thirds and negative 2. So finding the zeros is not a new concept, it just has a new name on it. Same thing with this one, the zeros are 5, 3, and negative 2, and so now I'm just showing you graphically how that looks. This has two x-intercepts, and so now we're applying a graphing concept to something we've already done. Here's what you're used to doing, here's them written as x-intercepts. And so you can see it crosses here and here, but it still has that U shape that we expect from a quadratic equation. The second example we look at is a square root function, and we know when we're solving a radical or square root, you get the radical by itself. And so that's what we've done here. Oops, excuse me. We've gotten it by itself here. You square both sides in order to get rid of the radical, so this is how we got this step. We move the x squared over, and then we square root. And whenever we square root an x squared, we get two answers, so we have to include the positive and negative. And so this gives me the negative square root of 10, the positive square root of 10, and this is what this function looks like. So we're just taking what we've already been doing of finding these zeros. Now we can write them as the intercepts, and graphically we know where those two points will be. And our last one. So when we're given a problem like a quotient function, what we're going to do is we're going to take that quotient function and we're going to set it equal to zero. In order to get rid of the step on bottom here, we have to multiply both sides by t plus five. So if I multiply, excuse me, I hit a button. If I multiply by t plus five on the right and t plus five on the left, on the left, it cancels it. On the right, zero times anything is still just zero, so it cancels it as well. So I'm really just looking at the top piece here. Well, that's something we can solve. You add the three over, and that gives me two, t equals three, and then divide by two to get my zero of three over two. So the zero of h is t equals three halves. And so you can see that in this figure, this would be the x-intercept. They're calling it t-intercept because we're working with t. Um, but again, same process that we've been doing, we're just putting it on a graph. Now in previous sections, we have looked at slope, and so now we're gonna give it another name. We're gonna talk about average rate of change. So we learned, we've learned that the slope of a line can be interpreted as rate of change. So slope, rate of change, same thing, different words. For a nonlinear graph who has slope changes at each point, so we're looking at not just straight lines, we're looking at these curved lines. These are different slopes. And so we have to look at an average rate of change between the two. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at, say, this point here and this point here, and we're gonna be looking at the slope to get from A to B, not necessarily following the graph this way, okay? So you're gonna do the exact same way. 
So same process, different name. And they're just putting in x, f of x is in here, but this is still like y1 and y2. So it says a line through two points is called a secant line, and the slope of this line is denoted as m with a secant on it. But guys, it's still the same thing. You still do, excuse me, you still do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. They're just using function notation here. It's still the change in y over the change in x, and it's still the letter m. So I'm going to find the average rates of change of this given function here. Now we are going to have an added step. They've only given me x values. So I need to find my y values. Okay. So in order to find my y value, I'm going to have to plug it in. So notice if my x1 is equal to negative 2, I'm going to have to take that negative 2 and plug it into my x's here. So that would be negative 2 cubed minus 3 times negative 2. Well, negative 2 cubed, that's a negative 8. Be careful with your parentheses. Negative 3 and negative 2, that's a positive 6. So I get negative 2 for my y value. So I can put that here. Same thing, you want to find x2. So you're going to have to take your x value and plug it into your function in order to find your corresponding y. Then you do everything like normal. So I have 0 cubed minus 3 times 0. Well, 0 cubed is 0. 3 times 0, that's 0. So I just get 0. Now the fact that I got the exact same numbers, that's not always going to happen. It just happened to happen in this problem. But again, you still just do your slope. You do y2 minus y1, so I would have 0 minus negative 2 over 0 minus negative 2. That gives me positive 2 over 2, which is just 1. So if I want to go from this point to this point, that slope would just be a positive 1. Again, that's not the slope following this hump of a line. It's just going straight from A to B. So here's a nicer way of looking at it. So again, notice that they've taken their, they're calling this the average rate of change equation. It's still just slope. They're saying, hey, I'm going to plug in 0 and negative 2 into my functions. And notice, they just got 0 minus negative 2 like we did. And they still got 1. So this will have a positive slope of 1. They gave us a part B. And in part B, they gave you two other values. And so they got 0 and 1. And so again, you're using your average rate of change, which is just still a slope. So if you just want to use your slope equation, it's the same thing. They're just using different notation. They plugged in 1 and 0. and they got negative 2 for their f of 1, and they got 0 for their f of 0. They subtract and off, divide it by the bottom, and they got negative 2 this time. So average rate change, new name, same process. So I hope this helps for this section. Let me know if you have any additional questions.